I'm happy to welcome you on board of the 16th webinar, EMCDA webinar. This time we will talk about drug-related deaths in Europe, and I will give directly the floor to our director, Alexis Gusdil, to open the webinar. Alexis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marika. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, actually, it's already the afternoon for some of you. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to welcome you for this uh, last webinar of the year. Actually, it's already the second year uh, of a series of uh, EMCDDA webinars. And we end up this year with a very important topic for us as the, the, the prevention and the reduction of uh, overdose and deaths from overdose is, uh, is one of the three uh, top level public health priorities uh, for uh, the MCDDA as part of our strategy 2025. And uh, today, uh, I, I know Marika and the colleagues, they will uh, introduce them, but I, I would like still to welcome and thank Andrew, Martin, Thomas, and Mark uh, for, for sharing their experience uh, and their, their vision of uh, the, the situation from their perspective. Um, I think uh, high-risk substance use and polydrug use is, is still fueling drug-induced death in Europe. Um, we, we also uh, uh, see that uh, in the recent years, uh, there was a stabilization of the drug-related death, no, no more decreases. We also observe uh, changes in the patterns of drug use. Uh, with, uh, with the risk behaviors covering uh, different age groups from teenagers in some countries, but in some other countries, those who are over 50. And then finally, we see also that uh, we, 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 we have a change in, in, the, in the, the profile, but also in the, in the risk behaviors, in the substance use. And it's, uh, it's uh, essentially, or it was essentially about heroin use uh, or opioid use frequently combined with other substances. Uh, in another meeting yesterday, uh, I had the opportunity to highlight the importance of benzodiazepines that I frequently found together with the uh, heroin or opioids uh, in samples of uh, drug-related death cases. So, uh, but we also see uh, an increasing change uh, towards more risk behaviors that is partly associated to, to the economic crisis and the consequences uh, of the COVID pandemic. And therefore, uh, certainly it's an indication that we should uh, redouble our efforts uh, and try to, uh, to, to find uh, better ways uh, to implement the best practice. And here um, uh, I mentioned on purpose best practice because uh, we, are, we are organizing the, this webinar in the context of the, 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 the bundle, the new bundle of, as part of the EMCDDA MIDI guide that is uh, dedicated to drug related death uh, in Europe. And, uh, and what we see is that uh, certainly uh, there is a moment for more efforts and anticipating that uh, with the economic crisis, possible cuts in budget, we need to make sure that uh, drug services treatment services, harm reduction program, they keep the, fi the, the financing. In some countries, they need more and more stable financing because uh, this is about the risk people are taking and facing. And it is one of the priorities of the, of the European uh, strategy on drugs. So I, I look forward to listen to, to the different uh, answers you will uh, provide to our questions. And I look forward also uh, to listen and to read the interaction with the participants before the final conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexis, for your inspiring opening. And I will give the floor to the chair today, Isabel Giroudon. Uh, Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marika. Thank you, Alexis. Um, I'm very, very honored. I've been very pleased actually to, to welcome our panelists. Um, we've chosen to invite some um, different people really. And as uh, our director said, it's really uh, the opportunity to share different visions and different perspectives. We will have um, uh, speakers from uh, 
from part of the European region where there is a really high uh, prevalence of high-risk uh, high drug use and drug-related deaths. Mm -hmm. We will have uh, visions as well on different types of responses uh, in, uh, in Austria and uh, of different problems in Norway. And as well, we'll have the, uh, the perspective from, uh, from Mark, the, the, the last panelist, um, with, uh, with more insights into uh, harms related to prison and to prison release. So it's a really interesting panel. And I will now um, uh, directly ask uh, my colleague Ali to move to the first question. And I will invite um, the, the speakers in the, the order I see them on the screen, which is first Andrew, then Martin, then Thomas, and then Mark. And I will ask you really to address this first question. So what is the current major concern around drug-related deaths in your country? And we ask that because we thought it was really important to have um, a a good view of the situation before you explain to us and you, you discuss the responses. So you will now please tell us um, what is exactly the situation and what is the major concern around drug related deaths in your country. The floor is yours, Andrew, and I ask you to briefly introduce yourself um, before you, you start. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew McCauley, and I'm a reader in public health at Glasgow Caledonian University in Scotland and delighted to be here today. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Isabel has asked us, uh, is to, to provide some context about what are the key issues facing our countries at the moment. So uh, the first key issue for us is that we have a historically and comparatively very high drug-related death epidemic in Scotland. As you can see from the graph on the left, drug-related deaths in Scotland increased for seven years in a row between 2014 and 2020 and have risen by nearly 450% since records began in 1996. In our most recent year of data, 2020, there were 1,339 drug-related deaths recorded, all involving people aged 15 to 64 years old. By comparison, in the same year, there were 650 persons who died from COVID-19 who were aged 15 to 64, uh, so more than double that number. And the annual number of drug-related deaths in Scotland now exceeds the annual number of alcohol-specific deaths in our country. And by comparison across Europe, if you look at the graph on the right, we, we sometimes have to redraw this graph and redraw the, the axes on this graph to include Scotland on it because our issue is so extreme. Uh, Scotland is on the far right of the graph, the, the large red bar, which exceeds all the other countries. And you can see that Scotland's rate of 327 deaths per million population is more than three and a half times the UK rate and more than 20 times the rate across the European Union. Next slide, please. Uh, the second main issue we face uh, is an issue related to uh, our toxic drug supply, uh, which is impacting on our uh, norm of polydrug use, people using more than one substance at a time. Uh, and in particular, the rapidly increasing role of benzodiazepines in our drug use. This has really driven what we've seen over the last six or seven years in terms of drug-related death increases. And you can see uh, it is the role of atizolam in particular, which has driven this. When first detected in 2012, atizolam was involved in just one death. Uh, but in our most recent figures for deaths recorded in 2020, atizolam was involved in 806 deaths or 60% of all drug-related deaths in Scotland, representing a 19-fold increase in just five years. And the graph on the right describes the trends in benzodiazepine prescribing in Scotland over the last 15 years. And you can see that the environment of benzodiazepine prescribing in primary care has steadily reduced over the last 20 years. And increasingly, the illicit market supply of benzodiazepines has replaced and superseded the availability of prescribed benzodiazepines within communities. So we really have a, a major issue related to safe supply at the moment. Next slide, please. And the third major issue uh, we face at the moment is in relation to health inequalities and specifically the widening health inequalities we see in drug-related deaths in Scotland. We know that poverty is strongly associated with drug use and related harms, and people living in the most deprived communities are more likely to engage in problematic drug use and in turn more likely to be affected by drug-related morbidity and mortality. In the year 2000, people living in the most deprived communities in Scotland 
had a tenfold greater risk of drug-related deaths than those living in the least deprived communities. By 2020, this ratio had almost doubled to an 18-fold greater risk, reflecting the widening inequalities in this epidemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'll give the floor to Martin. So good afternoon also from my side. My name is Martin Busch and I am from the Addiction Competence Center of the Austrian Public Health Institute. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see here the, the development of the number of drug-related deaths in Austria. Uh, between 2003 and 2011, the numbers were quite stable on a, a, a high uh, level, you can say. Then there was a decrease until 2014 and now in 2019, we are uh, hardly on the same level uh, than um, uh, in, in history. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the numbers are quite looking the same, but when you look into the data, uh, you can see an interesting development. Uh, in 2005, the, um, we had a very young population, 42% uh, of the drug-related deaths um, were below 25. And when you look at the year 2019, you see that there's just 15% uh, in, in this young age group. So something has changed. Uh, please, the next slide. <clears throat> um, when you look first at the graph at the right side, uh, this is our prevalence estimation of uh, problem drug use in Austria. Uh, by age groups. And what you can see is that we had an increase um, uh, among the 15 to 24 old people. It's the red line uh, between 1999 and 2005. And since then, the numbers are going down. Um, the same increase happens later in the group 25 to 34, some years later. And the same increase happened in the year 35 plus. Um, uh, another time later. And uh, you see it's a typical um, uh, wave. We had a wave of, uh, of incidents. And then this wave is going into the older age groups because when people are in opioid addiction, many of them stay there because it's a chronic disease. And uh, the consequence of this uh, high incidence uh, now is that we have an aging population of uh, heroin users. You can say the good thing is that the drug users survive and get older because otherwise uh, we wouldn't have this, this number in the, in the older group. The good thing is that less young people start opioid use. Um, so we don't have an, an rising drug problem, you can say, but we have rising uh, numbers of drug related deaths. And our interpretation is that the older, that, that the older group has a long, uh, a uh, long time of drug career and is more vulnerable to overdose deaths. Um, I think there are different needs of older drug users. The question is, do we know about them? Then we know that more than half are in opioid substitution treatment. It's good, but it could be better. So are there ways to further improve in treatment rate? And uh, we have to overthink if we reach uh, older drug users, especially with drug-related death prevention. So thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I give the floor to uh, Thomas Kruzen from Norway. Thank you, Isabel. Yes, my name is Thomas Clausen. I'm from the Norwegian Center for Addiction Research at the University of Oslo in Norway. Uh, good afternoon to all, and um, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, in Norway, um, so what you see on the screen now is a, um, a figure of the numbers of overdose or, or drug-induced deaths um, as they've developed with time, uh, split by men and women. And we see that we had a peak with about 400 such deaths uh, in the year 2000, and since then it, we had a decline. And then a long period with a relatively stable situation. And, and we are still considering the, the most recent year, 2020, to be within uh, that bracket of some sort of stability. Although we're also fearing that this is uh, beginning of a new uh, increase, <coughs> as, as it also might be indicated. And, and you see 
uh, development, particularly for women, um, has also increased over the past year and, and now has um, uh, a greater share, uh, maybe, of, of the total number of deaths. Next, please. So <clears throat> this is not a figure with real numbers, but its um, um, point is to show some developments that we and trends that we see. So <clears throat> the red line are the numbers of heroin deaths. Uh, and we recognize, again, the peak in year 2000, the 400 deaths. And most of them at that time were heroin deaths. But what, when we look into detail, what has caused that? It has been gradually reducing <clears throat> over time uh, and is now uh, at around 50 annual deaths related with heroin. Uh, but we see the blue line, um, which has gradually increased from early 2000, and those are deaths related to prescription opioids, such as oxycodone, tramadol, um, morphine, medical fentanyl, um, those kind of medications. And we see they have increased gradually. <laughs> um, and then the observed trend has been um, that relative stability since 2003, but we are worried that we are seeing the beginning of a, a second wave rising and then dominated by prescription opioids in Norway. Um, <clears throat> and, and we are looking into these details by research now and by some months, hopefully we'll have more answers, but, but we know that oxycodone, tramadol and <clears throat> the likes are increasingly um, causing these uh, drug-induced deaths. And, and that is parallel also with quite a large and parallel increase in the use of these medications in the population and also uh, the use of these medication for long-term treatment of chronic pain uh, in the community. <clears throat> so, so next slide, please. When it comes to um, those who are receiving opiate substitution treatment in Norway, um, on the left side of the diagram, you see, we see the mean age of those patients and it increases by uh, every year. Uh, as also Martin just told us uh, was the experience from Austria, <coughs> which is on the one side, good news, people survive longer, they stay in treatment longer and it's the whole intention with the treatment. On the other hand, and on the right side of the figure, we also see <coughs> the differences in drug um, related deaths in this population in those who are in open substitution treatment. And we can see that with age, uh, mortality rates increase, and that is particularly driven by somatic causes of death. And that includes liver related diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and lung related diseases. Um, and from 50 and above, that's the dominating cause in, in this population. And this reminds us that with the patients in OST um, that are in treatment for decades um, and their age, we also need to attend to their uh, healthcare needs other than just the substitution treatment, but also their somatic health in particular. So thank you. And that was what I plan to say for this first part. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I'm not sure we've got Mark. Um, I think maybe we had some technical problems because I can't see if Mark can join us. If not, uh, what I suggest is that we just maybe for just Mark to have the time to join us again. We will just move to uh, to the second question after we had this very. Um, interesting overview really of your perspective. I think it was really interesting to see uh, both the commonalities that you, you see in your countries in terms of uh, opioids being involved in most cases, in terms of uh, OST being in place, but not often and not always uh, at, the, at the optimal level. But there were some particularities and that's very interesting as well. You mentioned the Tizolan, the social circumstances around the death. So that was a really important uh, first part to really see the situation and how it can uh, be different in the different countries. I give you now the floor again to answer the second question. What is being done to address the problem? So again, please, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, traditionally in Scotland, the main tools to address drug-related deaths have been provision of opioid substitution treatment, mainly through methadone and since 2010, a national naloxone programme. Uh, but because the situation in Scotland has become so acute, uh, 
over the last couple of years, we've seen a uh, more uh, specific responses by our national government to try and address this epidemic. The first of these was the appointment of a drug death task force in 2019, with an aim of identifying measures to improve health by preventing and reducing drug use harm and related deaths. And the task force has three high level areas of focus. First of all, in relation to the emergency response, and this is related to prioritizing a uh, scale up of our naloxone program through a uh, uh, allowing police, uh, paramedics uh, and other lay people to have access to naloxone supplies uh, and also creating new non-fatal overdose pathways where people who have a non-fatal overdose can be fast-tracked into treatment services. Uh, the second high-level area of focus is in relation to reducing risk amongst those who are already at risk of drug-related deaths and that is focused around optimising engagement in drug treatment by implementing at first new treatment standards, which have been devised for Scotland, aiming to uh, allow things such as same day prescribing and to reduce waiting times and access issues in relation to treatment. And then thirdly, a more, uh, a more kind of long-term vision to reduce the vulnerability of individuals uh, aimed at reducing stigma associated with drug use uh, and focused on things like drug law reform. So particularly, uh, exploring issues around decriminalisation and other models uh, in relation to drug use. And the graph on the right just gives you a flavour of uh, what our Take Home Naloxone programme has achieved over the last uh, 10 years since it's been in place. This data is slightly dated now. It shows that before the task force was appointed, we had supplied around 60,000 naloxone kits uh, over that period. But since uh, the task force has been appointed, that has uh, dramatically increased further mm -hmm. and there have been over 100,000 naloxone kits supplied, including uh, a number uh, by the paramedics and also uh, uh, to the police who uh, have used it on multiple occasions since they were involved in the programme. Next slide, please. And the second major development uh, uh, is really uh, came about this year. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and this was announced in January of this year, just uh, a month after the latest figures were published. The latest figures, uh, again, were another historical high, as I said earlier, and really, uh, really prompted uh, action from government that a lot of people had been asking for for a long time. And to support the work of the task force, the, the government announced what's called a national mission to reduce drug-related deaths and harms. Uh, and you can see some of the aims and objectives of this are similar to those for the task force in terms of fast and appropriate access to treatment uh, and improved uh, drug services. Uh, but there's also specific mention of things like increasing capacity and use of residential rehabilitation uh, and a uh, more uh, joined up policies across sectors. So not just focusing on health, but also focusing on health, criminal justice and social care. And significantly uh, alongside the national mission was the largest investment in drug death prevention or indeed drug policy that has been seen in a generation. Uh, the government committed to 50 million pounds extra funding per year for the next five years, so a total of 250 million. Much of that will address the funding that has been cut from uh, drug policy over the last 10 years, but it is certainly welcome news and long overdue in the sector. And the picture on the right is just a, uh, uh, just to show you, uh, just this week, on Monday of this week, the government launched a new anti-stigma campaign, really framing the drug problem in Scotland as a health issue. And again, this is the first time the government has really led on doing such a thing uh, in terms of moving uh, the narrative away from drug use being a criminal justice issue to being much more of a health issue and trying to move the general population uh, with them on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'll give the floor now to Martin, please. So what is done in Austria in the field of uh, prevention of drug-related death? Uh, after a long period of, of lobbying and discussion, now we managed to, in to, to uh, introduce some 
Uh, Peer Naloxone projects, uh, at the moment we have three projects uh, in, in uh, nine provinces, uh, but uh, Vienna is included and Vienna is the biggest city in Austria. Then another thing is uh, what we are always thinking uh, about measures to improve in treatment rate of opioid substitution treatment. Uh, one thing is that, that now we have plans for a, a project of opioid substitution treatment with injectable morphine, because we know that there is a group of uh, opioid users who need injection, and uh, we would like to offer them um, this possibility. And also the law was changed uh, recently to, to make this possible. And another thing I wanted to, uh, to point is, uh, uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the control of prescription by the medical officers in Austria changed from personal to electronic way. And this makes uh, OST easier to integrate into daily life. Uh, before COVID-19, they had to go each month to the medical officers to, uh, to, ch to, to check uh, their prescriptions. And now this, uh, uh, this um, prescriptions are sent via electronic way uh, and uh, um, there are just some uh, <clears throat> some reports from 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 expert that this, uh, that at the moment we see uh, due to this change there's no increase of misuse but uh, a new client group is reached because for for for, for uh, uh, some clients it was too complicated and not to integrate OSD in the life with the former regime so but we have to, to, to look more uh, into details because there's no uh, no study on that or, or something like this but it was very interesting that changes uh, in the administration leads also uh, to be more accessible for new clients group thank you thank you very much and then Thomas Thank you. Yes, some of the interventions and uh, policies that have been in place in, in Norway, I'll go through some of them. And um, in Norway, the government uh, launched a national overdose prevention strategy in 2014, and it's uh, still ongoing. And, and one uh, feature of this is that um, this national strategy uh, launched by the actually former government is now also for the time being being uh, forwarded by our new government that came in position in October. So the national overdose strategy is surviving changing governments, which is an important issue, I think. Um, what it includes is it has central government funding um, on the, the overdose prevention issue and strategy. It includes um, a, a naloxone distribution program in Norway. It's, it's been a nasal naloxone device that's been distributed. Uh, and we started in 2014. And by now the, there's more than 20,000 kits distributed. <clears throat> and also as part of the, of the strategy, the, there's been increased access to low threshold OST around the country. And these are three, um, um, mentioned, but there are several other elements part of this uh, national strategy. <clears throat> the policy also includes uh, um, the availability of, of um, safe drug consumption rooms. And also this year, we're starting now uh, around Christmas, a project with injectable um, diamorphine, so, so an injectable heroin <clears throat> clinic as part of the OST program. Uh, this will be in the two cities, Oslo and Bergen, the two largest cities with the most uh, combined also uh, overdoses. Um, in addition to, to these more clinical and practical interventions, uh, there's also been funded from the central government and from the research council funding to better understand the developments regarding prescription opioid as cause of that. And this is ongoing and we're hopeful that we over the next months and years will know um, more of what's going on um, uh, relating to that. For example, we see that oxycodone and tramadol, they are increasingly part of overdose deaths, but <clears throat> until now we haven't known for sure if, 
if those who died had a prescription uh, or not, or if it was illicit uh, medication involved. And we will then use the, the prescription registry to link with overdose death registries and and, and uh, find out more of these details. Um, so <clears throat> overall, uh, there's been a commitment from the government to continue and, and uh, uh, for long term, both fund and have strategy plans to prevent overdose deaths. <clears throat> the strategy plans, they, they are of a four year duration and then they're renewed and um, revised. So we're currently in the second period and hopeful that the third one will start next year. And I think this is the way to go uh, because um, there's not one single solution that will solve the problem with overdoses. I think we need to uh, realize that we need a number of, of interventions and strategies and ideally combined as some sort of overarching national strategies that can be evaluated and adopted to the um, current needs in the situation. So, uh, um, and, and also one thing I'd like to just remind ourselves, I think it's very important with long-term commitments because over those situations they develop over time and um, I see no solution that will end them immediately. So we would need to be consistent and persistent with the efforts. And I think um, that's sometimes frustrating, but also something that we need to be um, engaging in long-term um, commitment in developing uh, always better interventions, but then in combination with others, such as provision of treatment and the provision of harm reduction measures, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and, and the, the other panelists as well. Um, yeah, that, I think that that's really important. You, you mentioned the national strategies and the, the um, it's, it's interesting that we see now in many of the European countries, there is really a formal group of people working on these issues and there is a strategy and things are um, really uh, moving forward. Um, we, we are still having problems. I'm sorry about that, but we, we can't see or or other panelists, Mark. So we move now to the third question. And I will ask you, please, from your perspective, what are the most pressing challenges right now? And what are the implications for policy and for practice and for research as well? So again, I'll give the floor to uh, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, so I've tried to break these down into, again, uh, three key uh, pressing problems uh, or issues uh, that we face at the moment. Quite hard to do that in three slides, but I'll try my best. Uh, first of all, it's really the size of the population at risk we have in Scotland. Despite us having a high mortality rate uh, for some time now, we still have a huge number of problem drug users and our prevalence of problem drug use is higher than anybody else in the UK and probably higher than, than elsewhere in Europe. So we still have huge numbers of people at risk of drug-related deaths. This epidemic is still very live uh, and not something uh, that's able to be halted uh, abruptly. It's going to take a while uh, to, to turn around. Uh, uh, and when you have a large at-risk population of mortality, you can expect to get lots of deaths unless you take radical action. And that's why it's been somewhat of a relief to see uh, some of the responses we've seen over the last 12 months after uh, many years for people advocating for change. And really the graphs on the right just illustrate uh, the issues that I'm talking about in terms of the, Scotland's prevalence of problem drug use being comparatively higher than in other regions across the UK. Uh, or uh, also uh, Scotland's mortality risk being uh, higher than in other comparative regions as well. So uh, uh, despite us uh, having some progress in recent times, we still uh, have a huge population uh, uh, to uh, uh, work with here. Uh, and that means that, that, that things are still in a very uh, uh, dangerous position uh, for us in terms of the sheer volume of deaths uh, that we're trying to prevent. Next slide, please. Uh, the second thing I wanted to highlight was treatment and effectiveness, and I think this is this this is arguably one of the, the the key explanations why Scotland has done so poorly in recent years. 
We obviously highlighted earlier the issues related to polydrug use and benzodiazepines uh, and uh, inequalities uh, in relation to poverty, but treatment and effectiveness is, is one of the key drivers and continues to be one of the key drivers. Uh, we know from the evidence that specialist drug treatment through opioid substitution therapy is the most effective intervention we have at our disposal to reduce the risk of mortality. But in Scotland, we continue to have among one of the lowest proportions of treatment engagement amongst our opioid user population. Uh, it, typically in Scotland, it's less than 50%, around 40%. When comparing that with England, uh, they are around 60 to 65%. And previous studies have shown, Thomas may correct me on this, so apologies, but previous studies have shown that Norway had treatment engagement of over 80%. So we, we were well below uh, what we would like to see uh, in relation to that. And we know getting people into treatment is very protective. Now, I think this is possibly one of the reasons why those treatment standards have been so prioritised by the task force and the national mission. And those treatment standards have now been published uh, and are designed to try and make treatment more accessible uh, to people, but also more effective for, for people because treatment in Scotland uh, until very recently has been very much associated with people cycling in and out of treatment very frequently. So engaging with treatment, but then dropping out within a matter of weeks uh, and as having what we call a high number of unplanned discharges. So people being discharged from a treatment service without completing a therapeutic uh, journey of care uh, in a planned manner uh, in agreement with their, their professional. Uh, and when people cycle in and out of treatment so frequently, their tolerance obviously fluctuates uh, quite uh, uh, markedly, putting them at risk uh, of overdose and other negative health outcomes. So I think a real challenge for us at the moment is can these new treatment standards be implemented quickly enough to, for us to uh, uh, at least try and halt uh, the speed of our uh, drug-related death increase uh, which we've been observing over the last couple of years. And this is certainly against a backdrop where uh, we've, we, we're still within the pandemic and the treatment landscape has changed uh, quite markedly during the landscape, uh, during the pandemic as well. So it's a very challenging environment to implement service change. Next slide, please. And then the final challenge, uh, and I deliberately avoided COVID-19 because I think people have, have spent a lot of time talking about COVID-19 and how it impacts on all aspects of life, but including uh, drug users and, and drug services as well. So I haven't focused on that uh, today, but I have made reference there. But I think the third challenge for us from a research perspective uh, is identifying what works. Uh, one of, I suppose, the unintended consequences of all the new attention on drug-related deaths in Scotland from government uh, and uh, from uh, services uh, has been a lot of new interventions that have been rolled out very, very quickly. Uh, and most of these interventions are generally rolled out without an evaluation plan. Uh, and a lot of the evaluation of these new interventions is usually done post hoc. It's not planned in any way. It's a kind of retrospective evaluation, which is not the way we like to do evaluation. Uh, and it, I foresee a difficulty uh, in over the next 12 months trying to untangle what the most effective responses have been amongst all the noise we have from all the different interventions that have been tried. Uh, Taking naloxone as an example, there have been multiple different new naloxone supply routes put in place over the last 12 months. And it's important for us to understand which of these is most effective that we can prioritize in the future. Similarly, there's been a big shift moving people away from daily dispensing of medications to more take home uh, doses uh, up to one week and two weeks. And it's very important we understand whether that's helped some people or whether that's had negative impacts for some people. I suspect it's a bit of both, but we have to uh, research that and evaluate it. So I think as researchers, we have a, we have a responsibility to work uh, uh, together over the next few years, uh, involving both epidemiologists, social scientists, and a whole lot of other disciplines to understand the impact of all these a fairly rapid and radical changes that, that, that we've observed over the last 12 to 18 months.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. I give the floor to Martin Bush. So what are the challenges, implications and possibilities uh, concerning the situation of drug related deaths in Austria? Um, of course, we should extend our pionaloxone programs to the whole of Austria. Uh, we should improve the in-treatment rate in OSD, for example, with injectable uh, OSD or also with, with um, making, making the administration easier. But I would also like to, uh, to point uh, to one uh, fact, which is somehow a little bit uh, neglected, uh, to my opinion, in uh, prevention of drug-related deaths. Um, you, on the graph on the right, you see that the percentage uh, of injecting drug users or the injecting heroin users in the age group over 29 is much higher than in the age group under 20. Uh, and we observe this fact uh, since, since a very long time. And it is somehow sure that uh, some um, uh, drug users change their route of administration from uh, snorting or from smoking uh, in the course of the drug career uh, to injecting. And if you could avoid this change, this uh, would uh, be a, a, a good thing to reduce drug-related deaths because the risk uh, for drug-related deaths for injecting drug use is much higher than for the other forms of administration. So if there would be ways uh, to avoid this change or to, uh, to, to make a change back from injecting to, to smoking or to snorting, uh, I think it could help a lot. And I think this would be a, a, a thing which should be investigated more uh, because, yeah, because it's, it's obvious that there is uh, some potential for prevention. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, and then I will ask uh, Thomas to, uh, to come. Thank you again. I think one of the challenges um, that I've also in a way highlighted previously is that um, we observe that those who die from overdoses increasingly come from diverse or heterogeneous uh, risk populations. Um, and that speaks for, of course, having uh, national and, and broad um, preventive strategies. Um, we've seen over the past 20 years that um, those who uh, have been traditionally using heroin, um, that is, is not anymore the main cause of that in terms of overdoses in Nor Norway, it's uh, prescription opioids in combination. <clears throat> so there's been a shift in the whole situation. And I think uh, we therefore also need to adjust uh, the preventive strategies, but that doesn't mean we should lose focus on those who are using heroin. We should continue this broad range of interventions that the national strategy and others have been, um, uh, ha which has been put in place for a long time. But we also need to develop new interventions, particularly um, targeted and to towards those who use prescription opioids in a harmful way. Um, and we think uh, that they both include pain patients who are taking their prescription medicines, typically combining sleeping tablets and painkillers and maybe alcohol, and that they can die from an overdose. Um, but we also know that uh, prescription opiates may be used in non-medical ways and also cause overdoses. So I think, again, the at-risk population is heterogeneous and we therefore need to apply policies that <clears throat> can meet more than only the classical heroin user. And that's one of the main challenges for Norway to, to actually do that shift. Um, and that shift uh, requires knowledge of the local situation. What is the situation? What, what are people dying from now and why? And, and what are their backgrounds? So for that, we need to know our local context. It needs evaluations and research of what's going on where we are. And then adaptation to that situation, which is shifting with time. So what was the valid intervention 10 years ago may not be that anymore today. 
um, and, and to monitor and follow that, we need um, research. But, but so for us, we, we need both to keep in mind the, the classical uh, illicit drug uses and heroin uses and now the new type uh, of at-risk population who are primarily uh, dying from prescription opiates. And then within the, the, the treatment system, OST treatment system, <coughs> um, as I've also shown, we are experiencing um, as part of a success uh, aging populations in this uh, treatment. But that also comes with some new challenges, which includes um, increased health, somatic health issues. And that treatment system hasn't really been um, on top of that situation. And I think improving screening and treatment for somatic conditions and lifestyle related condition uh, is important. And one example is that in Norway, more than 90% of patients in OST, they are smoking cigarettes and they've been doing so for, for many years. And, um, and they, there are very few interventions in the programs at, at smoke uh, cessation. And I think those are the kinds of interventions that would potentially improve the health and also survival of these patients uh, longer. Um, I don't know, do I have a, uh, another slide? Next slide, if there is one, yeah. And, and this is my final slide. Um, when I sum up the, the, the needs in OST programs, <coughs> I, I like to show this slide, which indicates that, that the, uh, such a program needs to balance different uh, dimension. So one is that we need to make these programs, OST, um, easily available. So in Norway, uh, we've also uh, added low threshold OST as, as part of the program. It should be high access to care and few people should be outside treatment. But then when we manage to do that, when actually we do have a large share of the population at risk in treatment, we also have to make sure that that treatment is safe. Uh, for those patients who are in treatment. And, and that has to do with quality standards and, and how the treatment is provided. And that varies within countries and between countries quite a lot. And again, we need to find a balance. It has to be safe enough, but also uh, we, we cannot, if it should be 100% safe, then it, the experience availability of the treatment will be low. So these, these dimensions, they they do interact with each other. So we need to find the right balance between several dimensions at the same time. And since these patients are going to be in treatment for decades, many of them, it also has to be a treatment that uh, patients feel is worthwhile and something that they benefit from in the long term. Um, and that requires user involvement and the attention to individually needs in treatment. So again, I think we need to be, bear in mind that, that all these dimensions, they are interrelated and they are part of the system and finding this right balance is not easy for any of us. Um, and, and it's kind of the, the clinical channel challenge for everyone every day, but still we need to, to maintain that focus and, and make it better because the overall uh, goal here is long-term um, <coughs> retention in treatment and where also other health and mental issues are dealt with in a good way while in treatment. Um, and, and again, to manage this and, and to do this in a good way, um, research and monitoring and adoption to changes um, to improve treatment outcomes um, is, is an ongoing need and requirement to make this happen. And um, a final comment um, for us to keep in mind is that if you remember back um, in history some years about the smoking epidemic, so let's say in the 50s and 60s, uh, smoking was popular in Europe. Um, but then we started to realize that smoking was not good for lung health and interventions to prevent smoking came in place. But it took between 20 and 30 years before we saw uh, that lung cancer deaths were reduced. So even though we implement new interventions today, we might not actually see results from them tomorrow, but it may take many years before we see results. Therefore, we need to commit uh, for long term. And we also have to make our policymakers understand this, that we need long term and coherent efforts over time, both with funding and with stamina in, in seeing what's going on. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, thanks, Andrew and Martin as well. Yeah, I think that was really um, very interesting to uh, to have your um, your insights and your expertise on linking the the data, the facts, and and the responses. Um, I think we we will now um, have more time to take some questions from uh, our audience. And uh, I will ask maybe uh, some help from Marika, from Ali, because you were keeping a look uh, and an eye on the on the chat. So yes, thank uh, you. Can we thank you, Isabel, questions? for optimal time management, in spite of the fact that you have missed one of the speakers. Uh, he contacted us to say that he was connecting from the countryside, so he wasn't able to. We have also with Barco Costa trying to, to find a way, but it, it didn't work. Um, there is one question for Martin directly asking if there is any difference between a uh, different age of uh, population in mortality rate and between uh, people in opioid substitution treatment and not in opioid substitution treatment. Uh, <clears throat> that is the second question first. Um, we don't know it exactly with our data, but in the scientific literature, you can find that mortality rate in opioid substitution treatment is much lower than outside. Uh, what we know is that the mortality rate um, of our substitution treatment clients is uh, really very low in comparison with, with other countries because we made some mortality cohort study. Uh, and uh, we found out that our mortality rate is, is quite low. Um, yeah, and what, what was the first question? Um, the other question was if you have um, your analysis stratified by age. So if you observe the difference between the older and the younger uh, generations. Yeah, that's, I think this is not this is not so easy because you would uh, have to put the prevalence estimation in relation to the number of drug related deaths, uh, and until now we didn't this. So maybe I, I think it's a good idea. Uh, we can try this for next year, but at the moment I, I do not have this uh, information on that. Thank you very much. There is another question about the occupational histories of people dying from overdose. And this is linked with experience from the United States. I suspect it is again quite a difficult question, but I leave it to our guests uh, to see. I could comment on it at least, and maybe the others will follow up. But um, in Norway, we've seen on the more social demographic backgrounds of those who die. And, and we, we are increasingly observing um, two or three different groups of backgrounds. So we have um, those who have very little uh, history of work experience, and they've typically maybe then been using heroin since the early <coughs> 20s and, and not ever entered the job market. But at the other end of the scale, we, we do have increasingly now people who have been part of the work market but, uh, or workforce, but then um, now maybe they are on uh, disability uh, benefits. We will find them in treatment registries for chronic pain. Um, and, and there are a higher number in this group are women. So that we're seeing this group of people who have been in the workforce, maybe they have disability benefits now and, and pain problems, and then they die from overdoses. And typically we find no illicit uh, drugs in the toxicology, but we find different kinds of medications. So again, in Norway, as I've, I've told previously also, we're seeing these two different at-risk populations, those who primarily have been using illicit drugs and heroin, and they're dominated by younger men. And then a new group with, with older, um, higher numbers of women and with pain problems and dying from prescription opiates. And they have, uh, for a larger, uh, a larger part of that has, has been part of the workforce previously. Thank you. This is extremely interesting. Thank you very much, Thomas. 
Um, there is another question addressing all of you from Chile. Um, Nicola says that in his country there is not a big problem now, but he would like to know what would be your advice to avoid having the big problem of uh, opioid uh, overdose for the future or drug-related deaths for the future. This is a little bit for, for all of you, I would say. Maybe I can give some answer. I think the Thank most... You. Uh, the, the most uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the most uh, uh, important thing is to have uh, good access for op for people with opioid addiction to opioid substitution treatment if I could add to that uh, as well uh, I, I think an important thing is to prevent people becoming at risk in the first place so uh, in one of my slides, I highlighted uh, health inequalities uh, and the role of poverty. So uh, if your country can prioritise keeping people out of poverty uh, as much as they can prioritise uh, drug treatment services and stuff that's a bit further downstream, then I think you can have uh, you can continue uh, to keep your numbers of drug related deaths at lower levels. But I think we have to look as much upstream as we have to look downstream uh, when uh, tackling these things. I can uh, add to that. I'm missing we... some of the words, I guess. Yes, please. Um, I can I can follow up. I agree ahead. with with both. Uh, uh, Martin and Andy here, and in Nor Norway also we see that those who end up in, in drug use problems and later are at risk of overdose deaths, they're those that we maybe could term outsiders <coughs> of the mainstream society. So, uh, And those who drop out from mainstream society, they, they are the ones who have not completed secondary school or come also from deprived parts of the country. They're not part of normal afternoon activities like sports, etc. So uh, again, I agree with what Andy said, you know, the general preventive strategies in terms of reducing uh, social inequality and health inequality are important. And as Martin said, <coughs> provide uh, rapid <coughs> and easy access to OST for those with opioid um, uh, disorders. Um, Again, I think uh, one thing that we need to, to remember is that situations change quickly. So even though we think or experience that overdoses aren't a major concern now, so the situation can change fairly rapidly. And therefore also having some monitoring systems uh, where, where we detect change fairly quickly and then can adapt to it and address it properly is important. Thank you very much. Very important remark. There is one question addressing you, Thomas, and it is about how difficult was, if it was difficult, the debate around heroin treatment in Norway. You mentioned in your presentation, if you can expand a little bit about this. Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's it's been a, a debate for many years um, <clears throat> and there's been probably strong um, uh, opposite views on it, um, and <clears throat> but then also the the former go government they uh, at some point decided that this is this was their priority, and then um, they they were um, in majority while in position, so they decided, and I think um, it's a good idea what they did. They decided to do it as a trial project, so they didn't implement it full scale. Uh, in the beginning, but they are try trialing it in two cities, and they also funded evaluation of it, uh, so that during the five-year trial period, there will also be an evaluation and, and a report, uh, which is to recommend what's what's going to happen um, after the trial period. Um, so I support that idea, but um, it was debate b before this uh, started. But doing it this way, we, we will also learn from the process and, and the, the evidence base will be as good as possible in four or five years when the decision is to take and what, what is going to happen with the program. Um, yeah. 
Marika, can I add to that? Yes, please. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's just in relation to heroin-assisted treatment. I think it, the UK is an interesting example where the UK government uh, commissioned a research into this a number of years ago, so a clinical trial uh, that people may be familiar with, which was called RIOT and led by John Strang. And that found evidence of effectiveness and cost-effectiveness of heroin-assisted treatment. But the government refused to act upon that effectiveness evidence and wouldn't fund the rollout. So what we have been left with is uh, two small pilots in the UK, one in the northeast of England and one in Glasgow, actually, in my home city, uh, despite the, the evidence from around Europe and, and other parts of the world that this is an effective response. And interestingly, uh, the new UK government drug strategy was published uh, just two days ago on Monday. And I think people uh, optimistically thought that heroin-assisted treatment would be within scope of that uh, because it was recommended by Dame Carol Black in her evidence gathering. But it is one of the notable absentees from that UK government strategy that heroin-assisted treatment is not within scope of that strategy. So despite the evidence that exists, it continues to be one of these treatment interventions that, that has not Curried favour with governments eh, for for whatever reason. Thank you very much, Andrew. There is one interesting question about what measures are in place for non-opioids related uh, deaths and, and people using drugs. I, I guess this is for all of you. I'll just say something briefly. I think Thomas highlighted this in his final slide that the drug death prevention services are very much focused on a traditional model of opioid users. And certainly in my country, they haven't modernized quickly enough to look at the wider range of substances that people are using now, including benzodiazepines, cocaine, gabapentinoids, et cetera, which are much more prevalent in the polydrug mix now. So. I think we have a we have an urgent job to to modernise their approach to reflect the type of substances people use now beyond opioids. But Thomas was the one who highlighted this, so he maybe want to add more. Well, I, I can just comment on it. I think you know, as as we all know, uh, or, or at least in in Europe and many places um, of overdose, that's eighty percent or more are related to opioids. So, but then it means twenty percent or around that would would be from other types of drugs, including stimulants, which um, are on an increase in many places, both cocaine and, and amphetamine and methamphetamine related deaths. So um, yes, I think we, we should not lose sight of the other ones, although we, we maybe have the, the main focus on the opioids, um, we should also um, diversify the interventions to include other drugs. And, and again, I think the, uh, the basic approaches would be at least uh, provide access to treatment. So we don't have substitution types of treatment for most other drugs, but at least provide drug treatment um, and, and keep awareness also on the other types of drugs. There is a challenging question about, do we have means to disentangle um, accidental or voluntary overdoses? I guess this is quite a difficult question, but uh, I imagine that sometimes I, there is the doubt. Yeah. I can start at least. And <clears throat> that is a challenge, I think, in any country. And as a general rule, I would expect um, um, suicides or, or volatile, voluntary poisonings. Uh, to be underreported in most countries. In Norway, at least, um, those who are coded uh, as um, um, volunt or, or, or suicide poisonings, they, um, they have to be confirmed with, with, uh, with a specific you know, farewell letter or those kind of things to be, be coded as a suicide rather than an accident. So I think they're underreported generally and, and it's difficult. I don't, I don't have any uh, specific suggestions how to do it better. But we need to be aware of it. And um, again, for, for those types of 
overdose deaths that are included in the main numbers, the interventions are quite should, or should be quite different from the accidental ones, because um, the accidental ones are, are those that we primarily have been targeting. But suicide types of poisonings and <clears throat> overdose deaths, then we should talk more about access to mental health care, um, and and you know probably also basic services in in terms of social needs. So again, it's the health disparities and it's access to mental health care that would be the types of intervention required. Thank you. Thank you to you, Thomas. Any other comments by yeah. the other panelists? May I? Uh continue um, uh, also you you, you uh, this this is some somehow how I hidden uh, um, think this suicide among the drug users in our mortality cohort study the suicide risk uh, of drug users was five times higher than in the general population uh, also there is this underreporting um, which was already mentioned so I think, uh, maybe a suicide prevention should be also a, a thing which uh, should be implemented in opioid substitution treatment or in other services with drug users because they have this risk. And I think the, 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 the number is much higher than, than uh, we found out in our mortality cohort study. It's just a minimum number and, and, and all, yeah, so, okay. Andrew, would you like to add something? No, I, I would agree with with the other panellists. Uh, all suicides in Scotland or all suspected suicides are investigated thoroughly, but the same level of investigation is not done on drug-related deaths. So but by virtue of that, it, it's, it's almost certain that some drug-related deaths will be underreported suicides. Uh, the size and scale of that, I, I couldn't comment on, but I think it is reasonable to assume that there will be some cases of drug-related deaths where the overdose was intentional, unfortunately. Thank you very much. I'm tempted to associate with uh, an old uh, study we made in Italy, the death study, where also we investigated the violent cause of death among people who use drugs. Uh, there is one question that is, uh, again, for everybody. And what about the role of distribution of food and proper living conditions as a measure for opioid prevention? So to extend the care to the condition. And I invite also Isabel, if you see some question that you would like to highlight, please do it. In the meanwhile, I see in the screen, Alessandra, you are sharing part of the responses guide. Um, but sorry, please go ahead with the answer. Food and proper living conditions. As, uh, yeah. Uh if I can start, Marika, I think it comes back to the, the issue of poverty again. So we talked about poverty and poverty uh, can be income related. It can be food related. It can be fuel related. So if people are living in unhealthy circumstances in relation to uh, whether they can't feed themselves or whether they can't heat their homes uh, or whether uh, they don't have a job, I think all these factors contribute to increase an individual's level of risk, uh, including our level of risk of poor physical health, poor mental health. And we know that uh, some of these are markers for poor uh, drug use outcomes as well. So I think if we want to take a, a, a holistic approach to drug death prevention, then we have to, as I said earlier, we have to look not just at the immediate kind of service level landscape, but we also have to look at broader uh, society and reducing health inequalities, because I think that that can absolutely help this agenda. Yes, I think it become particularly apparent during the COVID emergency. Can Any I other comments? Well? Yes, please. Yeah, I, th I agree with, with Andy there. And, and I think, you know, if you look historically, uh, back in, in in the UK and um, particularly and maybe Scotland as well, but when the Thatcher government closed down like the coal mine and, and, and the the traditional work towns and and people lost their jobs, some lost their houses, they 
um, got severely hit um, their, their economy, um, we, we saw both that uh, alcohol use increased, but also um, a few years later, I think, opioid overdoses. So that um, but when we have social crisis and people experience painful things in their lives, um, this is a risk. And this is what we see in the United States. So a lot of the overdose uh, epidemic that they've seen there is uh, among those socially deprived, those without health care insurances and all that, and, and they experience painful things in their lives where opiates, it being illicit or prescribed, uh, relieve that pain for some hours. And, and that really increases their risk of overdoses, I think. So, uh, and in the US, as you said, um, but when you had a large population in a, in a very uh, deprived situation and you get the COVID pa pandemic on top, those who are already uh, vulnerable, they will be more vulnerable with a new crisis on top as we've seen with COVID uh, in the United States. So, um, so I think this, this overdose uh, mortality issue is not independent of what's going on around us in the society. And social inequality is an important factor. Thank you very much for this. There are two questions that are unrelated, one with the other, but I would like to propose. them together and the final uh, remark it's about the role of uh, clean syringes uh, in the prevention of uh, mortality and I think it goes in the direction some of you has already said like package of interventions rather than disentangling individual interventions and the other so I say the two and then you can comment on both is about the role of stigmatization on possible voluntary uh, uh, overdose. Um, would like to start. Marika, sorry, I didn't hear the question. You broke up uh, okay. when you were talking there, sorry. Okay, the first question comes from Pakistan and is about the role of clean syringes um, prevent also uh, overdose. Uh, so probably as a package of intervention for prevention. And the other asks about the role of stigmatization on the possible voluntary uh, overdose. Uh, I don't know if any of you would like, like these two questions suggest the idea of providing packages of interventions. I can maybe start. Uh, well, needle and syringe provision, uh, th there's very, very strong evidence for the prevention of uh, bloodborne viruses in particular, especially when used in combination with opioid substitution treatment. That's when it's most effective. And we know there's also evidence uh, that people who have bloodborne viruses, so people who have hepatitis C or HIV, are at a greater risk of drug-related death. So if you can prevent the bloodborne virus, by definition, you can reduce the risk of drug-related deaths. So needle and syringe provision should absolutely be part of the, the package of interventions that's, that's, that's rolled out to, to people at risk uh, because they have multiple benefits. And in and terms of stigma, I think I think it's universally accepted now that stigma uh, is stigma does kill. Uh, stigma th there is th there is widespread stigma, stigma against is. people who use drugs. Uh, it's been well documented now, and I think that's a better understood problem now than it maybe was five or ten years ago. And the responses from uh, national countries are starting to improve. I gave an example of the Scottish government's anti-stigma campaign that was launched this week. Uh, and I think there is now a movement in certain uh, areas to, to try and frame drug use as a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. And I think that's a key, that's a key starting point uh, to reducing stigma amongst these populations. The other thing that's key to stigma is language and how we refer to people. Uh, and I think that has improved in recent years. We refer to them more commonly now as people. We don't refer them to them as junkies or addicts or all these stigmatizing terms. And again, I think the narrative in that is changing, not just within our own field, 
but also within uh, media as well. And journalists have definitely uh, started uh, to improve in that front as well. So I think I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area, but it's definitely, uh, I can see improvements. I'd like to add, uh, uh, add on that, particularly on the provision of syringes. I agree with, with what Andy said. Um, the, there's very good evidence that they prevent uh, the spread of infectious diseases and, and secondary to that also reduce possibly overdose deaths. But one important thing around that is the, the general uh, approach to an idea of harm reduction, because that discussion and debate varies a lot around the world. And, and in some parts of the world, harm reduction is not really accepted. So, the, so on those terms, uh, needle exchange and even naloxone wouldn't be acceptable. And, and again, what I think there's good evidence for is that the provision of harm reduction measures such as clean needles does not um, result in increased drug use in the population. So teenagers, teenagers in, a, in a country would not start to use drugs because there are clean needles available. There are other things that would cause them to start to use drugs, but, and if they do, clean needles would prevent them from further harm. So there's no evidence that the provision of harm reduction in being clean needles or naloxone will increase or encourage drug use in a community. It's, I think it's important to keep that in mind and, and spread that message. And I would like to add another aspect concerning uh, this needle exchange. Because all this harm Thank you very much. Or I give. Uh, yeah, another aspect on this needle exchange uh, program is that uh, sometimes it's uh, the first uh, possibility to get in contact with the drug users, and you also could give them some talking or some counseling when they change the needle so it's uh, it's it's part of a package and you uh, and it's always it's sometimes the first point of contact with these people thank you very much indeed so we won't be able to answer all the questions it always happens is a good sign um, i will give the floor to our director but there is one question i would like to pick for him and provoking and it's about uh, how to give greater policy attention to drug-related uh, deaths. This is one of the questions from our public. Alexis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marika, and thank you for the question. Um, so difficult to conclude, uh, actually impossible to conclude uh, and to summarize, but still a, a few uh, remarks that I would like to share with you. But I would like first to, to thank all the speakers and also all the participants and the questions. I think uh, your, your uh, fidelity to, to the webinars of the MCDDA, uh, your, your very active participation, it encourages us to continue. Um, uh, usually there is an evaluation at the end of the, the webinar, but I really would like to invite you even more than I do every time uh, that you should send us uh, requests or suggestions about uh, how we could be even more useful uh, for you in the future. As uh, Marika and all the colleagues, we prepare the program for the next wave of webinars next year. But also to see how, as uh, the European Drugs Agency, we can be more useful for customers and certainly practitioners uh, from the field and people who are using drugs uh, are among our top level priority customers. So the, the, the first thing that I note uh, while listening to the, to the different discussions and presentations is the, the dynamic evolution and interaction of the licit and illicit market. Uh, there was the example of benzodiazepines. That, that's something that we describe, I think, quite well as CMCDD at European level. But I, I, I think sometimes people forget or do not realize that what we explain or present uh, at your EU level is actually what is happening uh, in a very dy dynamic way at national or local level. So I, I think those are very useful examples. Um, I, I see also the growing importance in some countries of the, the impact or, or changes in legal prescription of opioids. 
and uh, and th that's very important because as you as most of you know this is at the origin of the biggest opioid epidemic uh, with the last year around 90,000 people who died from overdose uh, uh, just so so we certainly want to avoid this to happen uh, in the European Union and its member states uh, so something that joins uh, our message when we presented the European drug report this year, uh, uh, when I say that we may find ourselves uh, just uh, before the next perfect storm, is the correlation between multiple deprivation and death from overdose. And including, as uh, some of you mentioned, uh, the fact that uh, vulnerable groups are even more exposed uh, to the negative impact in terms of mental health of COVID pandemic and the lockdown measures. Uh, it uh, certainly can be associated to the economic crisis following the COVID pandemic, of which in the EU we have not yet seen the biggest part of it, uh, still because uh, the, most of the governments, they are still providing active financial support to the economy but the day we come, will come that this will end and that uh, the, the, the most brutal impact on the economy uh, will appear, again, affecting, affecting vulnerable groups, which means also causing for some people, maybe inducing a start in substance use, uh, but for some others also a change in substance use, for instance, because they would move for uh, cheaper uh, substances or mode of consumption. Um, and uh, and so certainly that's that's uh, uh, one of the things we 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 raised the awareness of decision makers because the clear message for two years uh, from two years of webinars and all the work we did around COVID our key message still is drug treatment services services should not pay the bill of the COVID nineteen pandemic and I think this message needs to be repeated until we are sure that treatment and services will not be disrupted next time governments need to, to make savings in their budget. Uh, another important point, which for me shows a very interesting uh, development in the recent years, is more questions about the quality of treatment. Uh, also, uh, the, the, to realize uh, that uh, we really need, especially at local level, you have shown, explained very good reasons uh, uh, that there is a need to increase the in-treatment coverage, uh, but underlining how difficult it is. And, and therefore, certainly, I think the fact that uh, we need to associate much more systematically the clients is certainly very important. Uh, one, one in that sense, uh, something also very even more important today than it was already before is uh, it's a, an emergent need to adapt treatment uh, modalities and services to the needs of, in some cases, an aging population, but in some other cases of people having problem uh, with other substances. I think about crack, uh, for instance, uh, and, and, and I think there are some interesting reasons from the evaluation of the DCRs in France showing that uh, apparently uh, there is a need to establish a better link with treatment uh, services, but it, this can be possible only if we adapt the services to what the clients can do. So it's not only a dogma that the treatment has to be in one way, uh, we need to look at what are the risks and what are the introduce much more flexibility. And I, I think that's something that, uh, as I myself, uh, uh, a clinical psychologist, I think that 10 or 15 years ago, we were not necessarily ready to consider. So we, we certainly need consistent and evidence-based national strategies, but uh, no need to insist that uh, your, your comments show that that's not granted. And even with the strongest scientific evidence, we are not sure always that uh, we will get the strategy and the policy uh, that this would support. Um, we need to continue to support an exchange on best practice on the implementation of programs such a, as naloxone. And I would like to insist that the MCDDA is there to provide any kind of support uh, for practitioners and uh, national authorities 
And we had uh, we are lucky that we have been able to support this discussion and to push for uh, for to help for some kind of conclusion. Uh, for instance, in Greece recently, um, need for more research and evaluation, and and again evaluation probably in the drugs treatment field is something about uh, new uh, relatively new as a concept, but I I think we. We, I, I know there are plenty of requests uh, and needs that are uh, put on the on the shoulders of people working in the treatment area, but that, that's certainly one of uh, one of the emerging emerging more important needs more than ever, I would say. And then to to finish with a, a general comment and reflection, I think that what um, what uh, some of you have explained in the in the very concrete terms with evidence. Uh, with some uh, diplomatic uh, references also, it's, uh, is that there, there has been an evolution in some countries at national or the recent years that has not always been positive. Um, I think what we observe in many places is that we have over-specialized and fragmented responses. Uh, and there is a pressure on the services in the same way that there is a pressure on the nurses working in the hospitals uh, considering that they should stop speaking with or talking with the with the patients because it's considered as a loss of time. But actually, this is this is part of the care. Th this is part of the intervention. And and I think the the pressure to efficacy to efficiency in some cases uh, may have as an impact that uh, uh, each of, as illustrated uh, by each of you. Um, we 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 should we should look more broadly, not only about methadone or buprenorphine, not only about the dose, but um, what are the new needs of those clients who are in the treatment, the same treatment with the same boring methadone for 20 years. What what are the different needs? How can we support? And this leads me to to the last point: is that we 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 need more inclusive policies. We need we need to to push. Towards a comeback, towards involving, involving and associating the communities. Uh, the communities they are part sometimes of the problem because of deprived areas, socially economically deprived areas. But there is no way to bring solutions if we don't involve and if they are not accepted by the communities. And I, I, I'm, I'm really worried to say that. Uh, uh, in many countries, when I look in the news or the languages that I understand or on the internet, uh, we have more and more discussions and sometimes conflicts about a solution that uh, in the case even the authorities want, want to implement a solution that uh, the not in my backyard reaction makes that because there was no, cons no consultation uh, or maybe that the people living in a socially deprived area have much many other problems that just drug use and that you cannot pretend addressing only the problem of drug users if you don't try to also bring a solution for the community as such so so and that's that's the part of our interventions that i think every 20 25 years we need to reinvent the same way that uh, 30 years ago in some european countries we dev we discovered what was called the community approach, uh, which still had different definitions if we compare between France, Italy, Spain, and the UK, for instance. I think we, we need to come back to this because uh, to, to a more fragmented society, to the pressure of the economic crisis, this, I think, will be uh, certainly the key to maintain the existing services and to help uh, to manage to help better uh, uh, people to survive uh, and maybe to get rid of substance use um, and and to find a way to build or rebuild uh, a new uh, a new life uh, while in any case the overall conditions remain challenging for everybody uh, having said that I, I want to thank you all again um, and uh, as far as I'm concerned I want to thank all the MCDDA staff who is involved in the organization of all those webinars and more broadly, uh, that are also involved and contribute to create uh, all those new MIDI guides. But we need to be and to do better. So we need your input to tell us how we can be more useful. So thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to see you next year.
Thank you very much, Alexis. Always inspiring. We don't anticipate the webinars that we have in program for next year, and I'm very uh, looking forward to receive uh, suggestions from our public. I would like to thank the guests, including Mark Johnson, who wasn't able but tried to connect with us, Isabel, who was uh, very good in managing in spite of some of the problems, and a lot of colleagues that people don't see behind the scenes, some of them not in service today. Marco Costa was helping us with our technical problems, Amparo Oliver, all the ICT colleagues, communication colleagues. I will uh, just launch a quick poll for our audience to ask them how to improve our guests can go. I will remain a few minutes to give people time to answer the poll and, and to leave. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>